I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. We'll start with my right wing or left wing, depending on your perspective, our IBM delegation. So if you could share a little bit about your firms and what you're, you're doing with regard to financial services. Oh, Mike. Yes. Hey, everybody. I'll keep it short. I know you're anxious to get food, but my name is Neil Sohota. I'm with IBM Watson Group. Louder. Louder. Yeah. Uh, business development lead. Basically, I help people understand how they can create new products and services using artificial intelligence. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> this is Saurav, again from IBM. And I don't think IBM needs any introduction as such. Uh, but um, just to say that, yeah, we are doing a lot of stuff in AI. Obviously, everybody knows about Watson. Um, so. There, there are a lot of, you know, important points or important things we can discuss. Uh, I myself work as a part of the IBM Cloud Lab, part of the analytics. Uh, I work there as a data science thought leader, and my job is to really uh, ensure or at least expedite AI adoption in our uh, future Fortune 500 clients. Uh, obviously, there are many are from the financial industry, so hopefully we'll have some good discussion. Great. I'm Zishan Ali with Beyond Limits. Uh, Beyond Limits is a cognitive AI company based in Southern California. Uh, our initial focus areas has been in oil and gas and healthcare, and now we're moving into financial services. Uh, my background is the last 20 years in, in capital markets and, and finance. And can you just define cognitive AI? Yeah, the way we look at uh, AI, obviously in the world uh, today, there is uh, what we call numeric AI, kind of the traditional machine learning, deep learning models that are heavily trained on data and data sets. Uh, and that informs a lot of uh, analyses and uh, insights based, uh, predictive values based on uh, a series of independent variables. What we do in addition, and this kind of goes back to our legacy, which I'll get, get into in a minute, is uh, add to that numeric AI approach a symbolic AI approach. So to think of these as kind of expert systems trained by uh, human experts, uh, subject matter experts in, in the particular field, whether it's oil and gas, healthcare, uh, or financial services. And that allows us to, to add another layer of understanding and in terms of uh, predictive discovery on whatever uh, problem you're looking to solve. So we're combining that kind of sy symbolic uh, cognitive reasoning element to, to what we call numeric AI. My name is Jack Coco. I'm the founder and CEO of AlphaSense. And uh, what AlphaSense does is we really uh, provide an information edge to our buy side clients uh, by helping them to acquire information much more efficiently. Um, whether it's analysts or portfolio managers or others in the investment process, uh, we help them pass through millions of documents to get to the key data points that they need to make a smarter investment decision more quickly and confidently. So you can really think of the, the product as um, effectively um, a Google for finance, a search engine that helps um, leverage AI to find key data, data points much more efficiently. So your focus is using AI to identify the data. It's not on taking the data and identifying action points that flow from it. Right, we don't actually recommend what you should do. We just help you really efficiently get to the right data points and uh, intelligently find uh, all the different ways to talk about a given topic and just uh, pass through that information uh, orders of magnitude faster than uh, analysts would have in the past. I, I started my career as an investment banking analyst and experienced the old school process uh, firsthand of uh, how you know, you'd spend hours and hours uh, manually looking for information, flipping pages, uh, control F searching, PDF documents, and we've automated all of this and applied AI in, uh, in a system that understands human language, financial language, so that it can find all these relevant data points uh, instantly. And just you know, what some clients you know, have told us is that all their analysts are sort of like a rain man. Uh, you've got all the, all the relevant data points at your fingertips and make smarter decisions as a result. Got it. I also was an investment banking analyst, so you have all my sympathy, and we have shared scars. So a question for each of our panelists is, what unique data do you have access to? Where did you obtain it? And can you give, share a case study of how you've used that data in your model to support financial services clients? Um, <clears throat> since I work with uh, 
many customers and many of them are financial customers. Um, the, the way I typically or my team typically help them is to uh, starting from data acquisition to cleansing to transformation, feature engineering, model, validating whether the model is good or not. So the entire thing, entire gamut of thing. And there is also now a standard process which is called CRISPDM, which is already there, which uh, people tend to follow. Uh, and in this entire process, I believe the most uh, important aspect is the data acquisition, which I think uh, even today the first panelist, even the second one, um, all of them we talk in detail that yes, that is the most important thing, otherwise we all know it is garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, but even having said that, there are a lot of new AI-oriented technologies also which are coming up, uh, which can help in data cleansing itself. So this type of things are also happening, but surely the data acquisition and cleansing part, the data quality, uh, they're still the golden rule for AI. Without that, the things will not be good. So great, great comments, Narab. I'll add on top of that, it's really important to understand what data is actually meaningful. The way machines learn can be very different than the way people learn. Since it's lunchtime, think about this. If you want to create an AI that could create original food recipes, how do you teach a machine how to cook? Doesn't eat, doesn't know flavor, right? You might think, well, for another person, I'll give them some cookbooks, we can watch some cooking videos, but you try cooking something and you taste it, right? That's not gonna work for a machine. What will work for a machine is you teach the machine chemistry. So think about that. Think about if you could boil down food to chemistry, then at the end of the day, that's actually what it is. The machine knows chemistry, it understands the chemical combinations that create flavors, tastes, aromas, the whole nine yards, so that you can actually have an AI, and this is actually real, can create new ingredient combinants that we've never thought of before. So when it comes to having the data, yeah, it's about data acquisition and cleaning, but we have to understand first and foremost what that data is meaningful. How are we gonna train the AI? And that's what the secret sauce when it comes to trying to do any of these things, because it's all about the training. Well, um, the, the data we ingest uh, is all the qualitative uh, research information that uh, quali uh, uh, fundamental analysts uh, use every day in their work from um, company filings, conference call transcripts, broker research, news, trade journals. And what we've done with this, um, I'll give you one example. Just recently, we expanded our company coverage. Um, as, as we're organi organizing all this information, it's really important that you can uh, slice and dice the information in many different ways. One is by looking at a single company. Um, public companies are easy. They're uh, very well organized and tagged in all the data sources that buy side uh, professionals use every day, but private companies are not. Uh, there are millions of them, um, tens of thousands of pu public companies, millions of private companies. So we took the public company information and allowed AI models to learn um, industries, industry language from um, the vast volumes of public company content and, and applied that to private company information and also allowed those same kinds of algorithms to learn uh, language models for, for millions of private companies. So that, now those get automatically tagged within all this information. So if the, if the task is to organize and index the world's uh, Investment, investment information. Now AI algorithms are providing much more tagging than in the past only people would do. So those are a couple of uh, examples of what we apply. Uh, I think from, from our perspective, I think what the, uh, my fellow panelists have said is, is, is spot on in terms of the data. Uh, I think the earlier panels also addressed the, the concept of data, whether it's traditional data, alternative data, et cetera. I think we take a slightly different approach that uh, data is one element to informing our kind of uh, AI systems. Uh, but we can also operate in environments where there is less data available. So again, we don't have, we're just starting our uh, efforts in financial services, but we, we have uh, a few years of legacy in the oil and gas space. And one example that we were able to demonstrate our approach was looking at wellhead management. So uh, one of our uh, clients had a number of issues with uh, offshore wells. And if you know that environment, it's very corrosive and sanding becomes quite a, quite a big issue. Uh, when we went to them to help them solve this issue around predictive analysis to, to, to make decisions and inferences based on uh, their data to, to help alleviate or predict some of the problems that, or challenges they might face, 
they came back to us not with gigabytes or terabytes of data, but literally 500 megabytes of data, and, and that was their, their methodology to solve this issue internally. We were able to take that just simple amount of data, which consists of PDF files and email exchanges, frankly, and then codify a human expert knowledge set around that uh, data to then inform their systems to be able to make that predictive decisions around it. So again, data is, also, is very informative. There is obviously a lot of uh, momentum in that space of informing decisions around uh, huge data sets and training systems and neural nets around data systems. Uh, but we're also taking kind of that cognitive approach to uh, a reasoning approach on top of that as well. So in other words, you were able to extract rules from this totally disorganized data set. Well, yeah, that, that was definitely one element to it, taking on structured data uh, uh, and uh, uh, applying a methodology around it, but also taking what we think is very important is, and this goes back to the earlier panels today, of, you know, we're not moving to a world of kind of completely automated in intelligence. Think of it more in terms of augmented intelligence, working with humans, subject matter experts in their respective fields, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's healthcare, whether it's financial services, uh, to, to develop uh, greater insights and, and predictive accuracy around uh, key decision points within an enterprise. Got it. So right now, VCs love AI, and I'll tell you why. Because it's red hot, it's all over the media, and the clients don't understand it, generally speaking. So that means you have a lot of negotiating leverage when the vendors, like our fellow panelists, uh, are negotiating with folks like you, the clients. So here's my question. Let's take away some of your leverage. And I'm not an investor in any of our panelists, so that's why I can ask this question. So starting with you, what's your advice for people who are evaluating AI-related vendors given most of the clients don't have in-house expertise in this area? How do they smell the people who have real differentiation from the people who are selling snake oil, uh, the signal from the noise? Are there particular websites or resources or consultants that you think are good for assessing vendors? And if you're, your brother, your sister, were CEO of a company, let's say a hedge fund, that was evaluating vendors in the space, what would you say to them? So I'd say, firstly, AI is not an end in itself. So uh, I wouldn't specifically look for AI solutions to, to a problem. I'd look at what my problems are and then um, what are the solu solutions that are available in the market for that problem. If that problem happens to be about data or information, then likely AI is going to be a big feature in it. Now, that's where it becomes actually really important. Um, it may not be um, required today to solve the problems of today, but as, as um, people tend to adopt software solutions as services, as SaaS solutions nowadays, you kind of get aligned with a vendor, and you, you end up using them multi for multiple years, and uh, often um, get sort of, it's really hard to rip something out later on. So it's really important as AI gets exponentially better, it's really, the algorithms get better, the processing resources get better. AI creates more and more of a wedge between sort of the, the solutions that don't apply it to those that go AI first and solve every problem that really benefits from AI, with AI, because that scalability is huge and really provides a huge amount of value. So I would look at it from, from that perspective, sort of what is, what is the problem that we're solving, then, uh, and then look at the vendors that are solving that problem and, and who, uh, who has the long-term potential to really provide exponentially better solutions based on the, the way they're leveraging AI. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would uh, add to what uh, Jack said and, and say it's really, a, a, I think the onus is almost as much on, on the client uh, as, as the vendor because, you, know, you know, it can be a simple case of garbage in, garbage out. So really define kind of what the pain point you're looking to address within your organization, what's the problem you're looking to solve. Obviously, there's, there's plenty of vendors out there and, you know, how, that, that uh, is a part, part of the sifting process. But I think that the, the, just as important would be kind of working in collaboration with the vendor in that discovery process. And what we found successful is that where, where is a more clearly defined use case, a problem that you're looking to solve, and then you can find you know, plenty of vendors to help you address that. But I think that the first step is even more, even more important to say, look, this is the issue that we have, this is the current process that we have, and this is where the failings may, may occur in that process of mapping uh, uh, to, to that particular problem. And then, and only then really, I think, then you should go out to, 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 to AI vendors to, to help address it. Um, <clears throat> I will try to put it like this way, that um, it, it depends on what type of vendor you are looking for. So if somebody is looking for the vendor who will give you the basic platform for AI, then probably there are, there are many. You can pick and choose anything. From IBM side also, we provide starting from microservice-based AI to complete AI studio, we call Watson Studio, where you can develop your AI solution. 
Next, where comes the next level of value add where uh, AI vendor, if they can actually give you a model where you really don't need to spend the time to create a model or further, you know, uh, do all the tuning and all these things. So if there are some vendors who can give you the model and that suits your purpose, especially if you are about to start. So choosing a vendor who have existing model in a particular area and you are trying to start your new thing, that's really phenomenal. But where the world is really going or the ultimate value would be where if you have a vendor who can give you the model as well as they can give you a hook to customize the model according to your wish. In our AI or machine learning terminology, we say it is as transfer learning. That means a model is created based on certain data. Now the same learning, whether it can be transferred to your domain. So I think that is the real, you know, I, I won't say nirvana, but surely some height of the achievement everybody is trying to look for. And probably that is the thing uh, one, one should watch out for. So I think good answers by everybody so far. Look, I know most people aren't technical people. You don't need to worry about that. I think the, the point about are you, what's the problem you're trying to solve is the key thing. And every, every firm, every bank, every fund has their own style and unique secret sauce to them. There's no, in reality, there's no like one AI solution that's a fit all. What you really should be looking for in a vendor is whatever they've built, whatever the foundation they laid, could that AI be trained in the way you'd actually do business and help you actually solve your problems. So if you're really looking for a good AI vendor, you need to find someone that can actually help you do that. I might add one more sort of practical suggestion. Um, it, it's, it's really hard to vet um, you know, these extremely technically complex solutions and try to figure out whose solution is for real. So once you get to the point of trying to actually vet the AI, and how, how deep it is, and is this going to really carry forward to uh, you know, that exponentially better solution in multiple years, I would find that expert. You know, use an expert network, find, find an expert to actually vet the, uh, the uh, solution provider technically. It's usually worth it when people are spending a lot of money on, on these solutions. And there are, of course, the expert network vendors, the GLGs of the world, but are there specific resources you would recommend for identifying people who are good at procurement in this space? I don't have a great suggestion on, on a particular provider. I, I just think you need an expert. You need somebody. Uh, it, it's hard for everybody to be uh, or go up the learning curve enough to be able to ask the right questions and push on the right topics to, to really get to the bottom of who's for real and who's not. Got it. So the title of this talk, which I love, by the way, I, don't, I did not write it, but I, whoever did it did a good job, is Uber Yourself Before You Get Kodak. So the investment management industry is a very lucrative industry, 36% average margins, but has a lot of unhappy clients, like all the pension funds that are not going to get the returns that they need to generate for their, uh, their, their, the people they're obliged to. So I'm interested in what should the established investment management industry be worried about? What are the threats to their business? Who's going to disrupt them? And disrupt here, I'm using that in the technical Clay Christensen sense, not the generic sense. Uh, I wrote a cover story for Institutional Investor in this, so I have a long answer to this question. But I'm much more interested in our panelists' views on that topic. Who should our audience be worried about that aspires to Kodak them? So, first, sure, I'm glad you liked the title. I'm the one that actually thought of it. It's actually uh, the, the name I'm using for my, the book I'm writing right now. Okay. But uh, I, I wouldn't call it a threat. I would call it an opportunity, right? Obviously, if you're not trying to disrupt yourself, someone's going to disrupt you. But we've unlocked a whole new set of capabilities, and I think that's where a lot of organizations actually struggle with. We're used to the old computing model about a machine being able to execute a set of instructions. Well, AI is called a third generation of computing for a good reason, right? We don't have to teach the machine, or we have to give the machine a set of steps to execute anymore. It can actually learn by doing. And one of the ways I actually see this in financial services is there's a company called Terramanta. And what they're trying to do is actually predict commodity prices, and they're using AI to do that. So in addition to all the usual metrics and measures and all that stuff you look at, they've introduced a whole new set called geopolitical metrics. So their AI actually looks at the reports, the statements from ministers. So like you have the Saudi Arabia saying something about oil production. It's actually weighing and assessing all these things and saying, hey, what is this guy saying? But more importantly, what are they not saying? 
what's their body language like to actually try and do more accurate prediction of, hey, which way is oil prices really going to go? It's the same thing. There's an ETF called AIEQ. Their entire portfolio is picked, bought and sold and traded by an AI. And the AI is using a lot of the standard metrics, a lot of stuff. But it's trying, they're trying to strip out the human bias from it and say, like, is there too much sentiment going on? Are we swayed by certain things or a recency effect? Right? I, I, for one, actually believe that it's incredibly difficult to predict the stock market because people don't behave rationally. Maybe a better way to go with AI is, could you have an AI figure out and quantify the irrationality of people and use that as a portfolio picking mechanism? Uh, there's a famous line from Einstein that two things are limitless, the universe and human stupidity. And he wasn't sure about the former. So I think you'll, uh, you'll have difficulties identifying any, uh, uh, any uh, problems there. Okay. Um, I, I really cannot comment on the competitor who to worry about, but uh, rather let me put it this way. Be worried about the competitor who has already started or already in advance. And I will tell you why. Um, to me, AI is like um, making your kids learn, right? And I have a two and a half years old, and every day I realize it like, like anything. So I, I think in the AI world, the key secret sauce is uh, get the first product or first thing out in the field as soon as possible. It is just like that unless I allow my kid to try walking herself or his, himself, he will never learn. And probably even after five years, probably there would be still some problem. So it is the basic thing about AI. Whatever it is, if something you think is still making sense, put it in the field, put it in the market, and see it is performing. Like the way we watch very carefully our kids' initial phase of when they are learning or talking or whatever, uh, the same way you have to watch it, and then slowly it will automatically start learning. So deferring pushing a product to the field or the, to the market is surely not the right idea. And if any of your competitors are already doing that, those would be the competitor to really watch for. And better you push your thing in the market as soon as possible. But, and there will be failure. Please be prepared for that. There would be the risk to that, but the model will learn, AI will learn. It will learn in that way. Yeah, I think uh, it's, my view is, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of disruption that, that's potentially out there. You know, we're, I think the audience is aware of some. In the asset management space that's going on today, you know, whether we talk about robo-advisors and, and, and kind of the other uh, kind of top-line uh, tech trends that, that, that uh, get a lot of attention, I think the, where I'd be looking for is just kind of the niche things that become more and more mainstream. You know, uh, it was mentioned earlier about some of this, uh, the work in commodity space. So I've seen some interesting startups looking at kind of uh, precisely that. So taking, for example, ship tracking. You know, uh, you know, oil big uh, oil tankers and kind of tracking, not just kind of traditional kind of uh, trade routes or, or shipping routes that they have, looking at kind of oil well uh, wellheads, etc. But uh, then using that to inform kind of commodity pricing models that are then used by these big commodity traders, and they're being used today. Uh, the AI engines underlining, underpinning that uh, to, to drive kind of security price, commodity price forecast, and put trading decisions around that. And that's just one example in kind of oil prices, and that, that we're aware of. I think there's, a, I think that can then be applied to other commodities, and eventually done, and into securities. So the point I think was addressed earlier fairly, fairly nicely by the panel on alternative data. That's one approach, but then taking that alternative data and taking alternative methods of analyzing it, because we're, we're obviously swimming in a world of increasing amounts of data, whether that's sensor data, uh, all sorts of, uh, of inputs coming in, but it, you, can, you can drown in data without kind of a coherent approach to, to addressing it. So I think we're seeing some interesting, I, I can't name the particular funds or, or the vendors who are helping to do that, but there are very interesting uh, models that are being developed uh, and that could underpin or you know, uh, up, upend some elements of the asset management industry. So I would add that uh, you know, buy-side firms are active managers are really um, under attack from two directions. Of course, uh, passive management um, for one, but uh, really more importantly, um, this has always been the case from other active managers. It's the most fiercely competitive market there is. Uh, securities market is just uh, everybody's trying to 
find an edge and even a uh, little bit of an information edge against um, others. And, um, and technology um, is, is really the big and growing differentiator here. I mean, humankind has looked for technology advantage since the Stone Age, building better weapons, and nowadays the weapons are information technology weapons, and AI is the one that is, has the, the greatest potential for that exponential advantage, where it really creates a big, big differentiator. If you're uh, the asset manager that uh, is not leveraging technology and uh, is years behind others that are, then the risk is that you end up being one that's performing better than the passives, and, um, and that's where I think a lot of the battle will be fought, is really applying technology and, and AI at the forefront of that. Agreed. So I think we have time for one or two questions before the 205 panel. Any questions? Um, so I'm curious, as the industry has evolved, how, when you're, you joined or founded your business, what was your original vision and how, what mistakes did you make and how do you assess the market now in terms of the applicability of your solutions in financial services? Well, um, in, in the early days, everything was completely manual um, uh, and uh, that's really what created the opportunity for, for us. It, you know, I, I was um, doing my research, um, you know, Searching PDFs, printing documents, flipping pages, and uh, many years later, after leaving uh, investment banking, I still saw people doing that. Um, what's evolved is that there are starting to be all kinds of technology solutions uh, out there. But what's uh, perhaps um, still creating a lot of this opportunity is, is now uh, new technologies that you know around AI, around natural language processing, are are providing so much uh, opportunity that that's um, there is. Uh, that sort of uh, a chance to really push things forward um, by um, by even bigger magnitudes by by combining these technologies and building upon different layers of technology to deliver uh, much more powerful, powerful solutions. So um, I, I'm every every bit as uh, excited as I was uh, in, in starting this about the the opportunity of you know what we can really do in, with technology to help the um, investment management industry. Uh, yeah, I would just say, you know, never underestimate the power of serendipity. I mean, for, for us, uh, we, as a company, we started four years ago, uh, came, coming out of the space program, NASA, JPL, Caltech. And, uh, we, you know, like most technology companies in the early days, we were the hammer looking for nails. And uh, got introduced to a, a major oil major, uh, and from that put us on a strong trajectory within oil and gas. Thinking we were only going to be an oil and gas company, focus, AI company focused on oil and gas segment, we then got into a, addressing an issue for an, this oil and gas client, uh, whereby we, we're doing this uh, ship tracking uh, for them and helping them understand kind of commodity prices on, in the energy sector. And well, lo and behold, from that process of discovery and serendipity, we, we then moved into the financial services space, working with commodity uh, tr trading firms and, and, and larger hedge funds uh, in that, com uh, in that uh, process of uh, commodity trading. So I think uh, in each step of the way, you can, you can, you can highlight uh, there was a vision, but there was also a, a, a lot of luck along the way uh, to get us to, to, to where we are. Got it. And could you comment on IBM's view on AI? The company's very clearly made a firm-wide orientation to focus on AI. Uh, what was the original strategy there, and how would you describe the strategy today? Well, Watson actually was conceived in 2006, just could a machine play Jeopardy, and February 2011, it did the Jeopardy challenge. That was almost eight years ago. I don't think we really had a good idea that all of what happened, ha what has happened, would have happened. And I can tell you that it's helped pioneer this whole new wave of AI, and I think it's, it's been fantastic, but we barely scratched the surface. We, we know that it's hard to predict the future, but 10 years from today, it's most likely that at least 90% of every product and service that you guys have have some AI component to it, right? People have been aggressively pursuing this for three years now, so bad news is, if you're thinking about it now, you're three years behind the curve. The good news is there's so much that needs to be done and there's so much opportunity, and there's such an opportunity for people that are willing to think differently that we've barely scratched the surface in terms of what can be accomplished. So the good news is there's a lot of opportunity for you out there by using you know, financial services products powered by AI. Um, I think um, from vision perspective, 
the way it is slowly progressing towards is that um, if you see the difference from previous system to AI is essentially AI is replacing the rules-based systems, right? Like rules were very brittle, they change, especially in today's business area where business itself change, model changes. So AI is essentially replacing the rules-based system where AI essentially learning from the examples. So there is a code still there which helps to learn from the example. Now the next generation is essentially when even you will write the code using the examples. So that is probably the next thing which is going to come in the, in the world of AI and that's where the vision is. So we are back on schedule. Thank you so much to our panelists who I think will be staying around afterward for further questions and look forward to talking with all of you.